And this is just a little reminder from the uh, Ohio Department of Environmental Protection, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, that algal blooms are impacting water quality and impacting people's lives, and much of that is coming from aquaculture. Uh, next slide. Uh, but these issues are not new. Uh, coincidentally, the year that uh, Wayne and I were born, uh, the Cuyahoga River caught fire. In fact, it caught fire on a regular basis. And that picture you're seeing, those clouds of smoke, that is not a building burning or a factory burning. That is the river burning, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio on fire, which, as I said, repeatedly <laughs> occurred throughout the 50s and 60s and was a major impetus for the, the creating and passage of the U.S. Clean Water Act, our major statute to protect water quality in the United States. And um, this was, unfortunately, our early response to environmental protection, basically a reactive response. And most of the major statutes in the United States, which are pretty advanced compared to other countries, are reactive statutes. The Clean Water Act was a reaction to the Cuyahoga River catching fire. The Clean Air Act was a reaction to air aversion, inversions from the 1950s, uh, where air became stagnant in major cities and un unhealthy to breathe, and many people died as a result of that. Uh, the Bhopal chemical explosion in India, um, the, uh, the pollution of something called the Love Canal in upstate New York, uh, also contributed to hazardous material, emergency response uh, statutes and regulations. But all through the 60s and 70s and into the 80s, we passed some incredibly progressive statutes at the federal level in the United States, but they were all reactive. They weren't systems approaches. They were, we've got a problem, we need to deal with it. We need to be the little Dutch boy or the uh, or Chicken Little saying that the sky is falling, we need to do something. And progressive, albeit progressive for the time, but kind of missed the mark in understanding it, that we need to retune and shift toward a, a more holistic approach to environmental management and our relationship with the natural world. Uh, next slide. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this pro Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, Wait, I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, I turned my webcam off just to, so people could see the whole slides better, so I turned it off. But I was just going to say, Dennis Kucinich is a friend of mine. And Dennis was a politician in Ohio, a congressman, governor, and, and, and in the 70s. And the Cuyahoga River was still having fires occur on it into the 70s. So, uh, <laughs> Okay, so sorry to assume it was uh, more in the history. Uh, by the way, if any of you know of a singer by the name of Randy Newman, Randy wrote a song about the Cuyahoga River catching fire, and I've got a few lines from the song because it's, uh, I'm very inspired by music, by the way, and I've got a few songs that I'll reference here that were with seminal influences in my life. Uh, but Randy Newman, uh, in his song, uh, Burn On, Big River, Burn On, um, says uh, in the lyrics, um, the Lord made you, oh, the Lord made you churn, and the Lord made you tumble, and the Lord made you overflow, but the Lord did not make you burn. <laughs> uh, the, that song was, was a great, a great uh, environmental activist song back in the 1960s. So the next slide, to make the point, these problems have not gone away. We've, we still have major chemical spills and major pollution problems. And uh, I'm sure many of you in the United States, even some of you abroad, know about the uh, uh, the water contamination in the city of Flint, Michigan, uh, a rather poor uh, community, many people of color that uh, had serious financial problems. And the the entity that was established to oversee finances in the city made a rather imprudent decision to draw water from the Flint River, uh, which uh, was polluted and I think acidic. David, uh, Wayne, you could probably speak to this better than I can. And as a result, a uh, great deal of contamination uh, polluted the water in the city. They still haven't solved this problem, I think, two or three years later. It's affected public health. People don't know yet how the lives of their children will be affected by the pollution that was caused by imprudent management, short-termism, and uh, a lack of understanding that people need to be cared for. So we're still facing these issues. And this was not in the Trump administration. This was during the Obama administration. So these problems go beyond polit politics. Um, next slide. By the way, before we move, just real quickly, the problem at Flint, which the water is acidic, but it's mainly lead. And the, the challenge we have is that when lead, lead is colorless, odorless, tasteless. 
and we really don't know all of what its negative impacts are. All we know is it is a mental, it's a neural uh, impactor. And so we, will, we won't really even know the long-term effects for years to come, but we know how bad they're going to be. And, um, and it's hugely impactful on children. So as this picture you see here shows. Yeah, very much so. In fact, um, when I worked in the New York City Department of Environmental Protection in the 1980s and 1990s, we, I was involved with the lead and asbestos control programs, and we were doing our best to, uh, to remediate both those problems, lead primarily from lead paint in, apart in people's apartments, and we knew that it was a ticking time bomb and that our programs were, and even the federal programs were, wholly uh, inept in dealing with these broad-based broad problems. And in, in 2018, in New York City, recently we have found major problems with lead paint pollution in our uh, public housing complexes. And now uh, the city is attempting to respond to this issue, and people are shocked by this. But any of us who worked in the field knew that, uh, that this was never adequately addressed. Lead paint had been used for many years, still existed, maybe not at the top layers of paint, but in buildings that were more than 30, 40 years old, in lower levels of paint, they had to, to flake off and to eventually impact uh, the health of children. And now the city of New York is desperately trying to find out how, figure out how they can remediate literally hundreds of thousands of housing units where, where young children are being exposed to lead paint. So this problem is still with us today. So I'd like to switch gears unless there's any questions. Uh, Wayne, any questions? I muted, I muted myself for a second. We're good. Oh. It's interesting. You have some people who had no idea about the Cuyahoga River um, burning, which is, just shows you that, man, we, for you and I, it seems like it was almost yesterday, but, but it was a while ago. And yes, um, that was true, Monique. It was on fire. That was not just Photoshop. <laughs> so, <laughs> burn um, on, big river, burn on. Go, go on YouTube. You can listen to the song. It's chilling. Uh, so I want to switch gears now. As I said, I spent my entire career working on these big picture, picture issues and very much taking kind of an incrementalist approach. Let's engage government. Let's engage industry. Let's find ways to, to try to move in the right direction. And um, now that I'm not working for the federal government and I have a little bit more control of what I do and also uh, – the situation has changed, primarily in part because of the Trump administration, but I don't want to put all the blame on this administration. Uh, we've got some pretty far-reaching problems that are making me question a lot about what, I put in, what I'm putting my time and energy into. So now I want to talk a little bit about uh, other aspects of my life beyond my professional life. So, Wayne, if you go on to the next slide. Although I live in New York City part of the time, and I'm a, I'm a New York boy, I, grew up in New, I was born and grew up in New York, uh, but I grew up in a small in a part of New York called Rockaway Beach. And Rockaway Beach is off at the periphery of New York, and we used to joke that it had the very worst of, of the city with the very worst of, of rural America, all rolled into one. But actually, that, that was a joke. It was, it was really very much a typical American small town. It was a tourist town. Our population during the summer was about 10,000, I'm sorry, during the winter was about 10,000 people, and during the summer about 100,000. So things were very nice and quiet in the winter. We couldn't wait for the tourists to leave, and we still had a lot of open land at the time. And as I mentioned early in the conversation, my greatest pleasure was getting on my bicycle and finding the woods and the, the wetlands and the marshes and just losing myself in the wilderness. Uh, so... I have always been drawn to small towns and always been drawn to, to the countryside and wilderness. And in fact, my dad grew up on a farm in this region called the Catskill Mountains, where I live today most of my life, most of my time. And that's where I am focusing very much on my own personal resilience, my family's resilience, and my community's resilience in the Catskills. And the Catskills, as you can see, it's a little hard to see, but the map uh, the very map, the map at the very lower left-hand corner shows where New York State is within the United States, the, uh, the northeast part of the nation. And within New York State, you can see the Catskill Mountain region in the um, sort of the uh, lower central portion of, of New York State, about 100, 
25 miles from New York City. And the Catskill Mountains are part of the New York State uh, wilderness area that was established by an act of the New York State Legislature in 1885 under the, the motto, Forever Wild. And I have more t-shirts than I can count that say Forever Wild, which characterizes my personality and my belief in protecting this region. Now, Forever Wild legislation was initially developed to protect the Adirondack region, which is in the upper portion of the state, upper uh, eastern portion of the state, and it's a much larger wilderness area, not shown on this map, and it was preserved in response to uh, a, a growing awareness in the United States that uh, we were eating up our wilderness, that wilderness had value. There was actually a, a painting school called the Hudson River School where we had these grand landscapes on massive canvases. If you ever come to New York, you can go to our museums and see these incredible paintings of, of the splendor of New York wilderness. And people were inspired by this, and the legislature passed the statute that created the Adirondack Park. Uh, the Catskills Park was another story. Uh, there was a lot of political horse trading because the, uh, the legislature was having a hard, well, the people who were promoting this legislation were having a hard time getting enough legislators to sign on. And the legislators in the Catskills region had a brilliant idea. Their region had been heavily denuded by, um, uh, by the production of, uh, uh, by the, the proliferation of tanneries producing leather, primarily for the Civil War. Uh, much of the the, so, the saddles and holsters and uh, and belts that were worn by the Union soldiers were produced in tanneries in the Catskill Mountains, and that was because the, the Catskills were dominated by hemlock trees, and hemlock trees in their bark have high concentrations of tannic acid, which were used in tanning process, hence the name tanning, and to get to the tannic acid, you had to cut down the trees. So the Catskills were absolutely denuded by the 1880s. And a lot of the land was uh, was going into government hands in a process called in-ram, where basically the owners were walking away because the, the land no longer had any value. And the communities in the Catskills were stuck with hundreds of thousands of acres of useless land. So as part of the horse trade to establish the, the Adirondack Park, the Catskills legislators said, uh, we will only sign on to this plan if you include the Catskills. And as a result, the state would pay money to uh, to the local municipalities to allow this land to be part of the wilderness preserve. Uh, so this denuded landscape was left alone for well over 100 years, and luckily the forest returned, and uh, the area became a beautiful wilderness area again. And uh, what's kind of interesting is a lot of locals up there uh, deride the fact that the state plays such a heavy role in our, our, in our political affairs. Uh, but the prime economy of the region is tourism and a little bit of uh, logging and some agriculture. But that would not have happened had the land not gone to the state and has been preserved for many years. So my dad grew up on a dairy farm in the Castile, so he couldn't wait to get away. It was a real uh, uh, tough life. Uh, they had no phone. They they were apparently burning too many pine trees because they had chimney fires all the time. And any time they'd have, have the chimney fire, my dad would have to ride into town to get the fire department some of his worst memories. So like any kid, uh, whatever my father hated, I wanted to do. So I couldn't wait to get up to the Catskills. And uh, I eventually built a, ha built a house in the Catskills in the late 1980s. And uh, I've been part of that community and, and loving it for those past 30 years. So go on to the next slide. So we, we have a, a wonderful community emerging in the Catskills of sustainable farmers, farm-to-table restaurants, and uh, uh, sustainable energy efforts. Uh, we still have a lot of good old boys who think this stuff is rather annoying, but uh, but the body politic is shifting. We've got a wonderful green market uh, in my town, and it's called the Pack Attackin' Market, and it has a great history because it was actually a trading spot for the native peoples, the uh, Lenny Lenape Indians, uh, and uh, it also was the site of a, a, a round barn, which was a an innovation around 1900 of uh, of having the cows come into the barn in the round and the milking activity would be in the center of the barn. It was much more labor, uh, much more efficient use of labor. So the barn was restored at the site of this market and uh, we have scores of local farmers and craftspeople who come to the market every, every Saturday and uh, sell their wares. And then if you look at the lower right-hand corner, 
Uh, the woman to the left is my friend Corrine, who has a small dairy farm with her husband. And they realized many years ago that they couldn't make a go of it selling milk, so then they began to produce cheese, uh, cheeses. And uh, they're artisanal cheeses. They actually have a cave on their property, and these are cave-age cheeses. And their products are in great demand. And because uh, Corrine knows that I'm in the ag field, every time she sees me, she brings me articles and tells me stories about how difficult it is for small dairy in the United States right now. And she's a, an absolute sweetheart. And the woman next to her is a new vendor at the market, a woman by the name of Tanya, who I've just met. And Tanya and her husband have a, a, a beef operation. And what I didn't know, I knew they were they used sustainable principles, but I was talking to her about holistic management. And I found that not only does she and her husband employ holistic management on their ranch, uh, but um, she is one of the local instructors in holistic management in the region and also uh, in farm and ranch economics. And uh, I think she's going to be a new friend. And the picture in the center, which I wanted to get to, is, uh, is a new group that we've established in the Catskills called Transition Catskills. And what's featured here is an herb spiral, which is a permaculture approach to producing herbs that are used for, uh, for food and medicinal, medicinal, uh, medicinal purposes. But Transition Catskills is part of an international movement called Transition Towns. It was started in the United Kingdom. I know, Wayne, you have one in your area, Boulder. Uh, Michael Brownlee, who I met, by the way, through one of your events, uh, who first started out creating uh, Transition, I think, Transition Boulder. And uh, these are groups that start up locally and attempt to plan and engage community around envisioning how commun community will survive and thrive when the oil is not, not quite so available. And we're just starting our group. It's a couple of years old, and we've got a lot of interesting projects and educational programs, and hopefully it will be a way to engage people from the broad political spectrum who are concerned about community resilience and, and community vitality. Uh, next slide. So on the personal level, uh, I have two incredibly intelligent and supremely obnoxious sons uh, now they're 30 years old and grown and uh, great people. But uh, my son, Jake, uh, would challenge everything. And at six years old, uh, he once said something to me that I, I used in about every speech I ever I gave for the next two or three years. Uh, he was listening to a radio report about, um, uh, about habitat protection, actually protection of endangered species and how important it is to protect habitat um, in order to protect endangered species. And at six years old, he said to me, Daddy, I don't understand. And I started to explain to him about uh, the importance of protecting habitat, I mean, of, uh, of endangered species protection. And he stopped me mid-sentence. He said, Dad, that's not what I don't understand. I don't understand how grown-ups think you could protect an animal without protecting its habitat. And um, he never stopped challenging me on, on issues like that. And he began to, as he got a little bit older, he began to challenge me about how can I be this big time environmentalist if I'm uh, getting in my car every weekend and driving 125 miles to my house in the country and having two homes and uh, isn't this a little bit hypocritical? And I took it to heart and I realized I've got to, I've got to reduce my footprint. So um, I super insulated the house. I uh, put solar panels up, um, and every picture here is a story because uh, <laughs> everything in life is. Uh, the, uh, the solar panels, it's a little hard to see in the picture, but they're above the peak of the house. And the reason they're above the peak of the house is because, as you can see, I'm in the middle of the woods. So when I wanted to install solar, I invited contractors up to give me estimates, and every contractor that came to the house said, you're going to have to cut down those trees and those trees because you're not going to get enough solar uh, exposure unless you do that. And to me, that was the ultimate of absurdity to, to put up solar to reduce my, my environmental footprint and cut down a dozen, tree, dozen mature trees in the process. So I had to find an, a, a contractor that was actually willing to do some engineering work. And although it doesn't look like much in this picture, if you saw a picture of the back of the house, there's a massive superstructure behind this array so that the panels are about... I think about eight feet above the peak. And as a result, the house is net positive. A uh, result of, um, of all the efficiency measures I put into the house, uh, all LED light bulbs, super insulated, several other things, uh, ultra-efficient refrigerator. Uh, but also I, I didn't want to rely on, uh, on fuel oil for the house. So I wanted to put in a, a wood stove. 
So, of course, I marched into town and went to the local wood stove company and picked out this real pretty soapstone stove and uh, put my deposit down and went home and went to sleep. And about 4 o'clock in the morning, I woke up in a sweat. And I said, wait a minute, this does not make sense. I've been reading all these articles about the danger of wood burning, particulate matter and air inversions in funky little towns like Aspen, Colorado, and, and I can't do this. Uh, so I called the, uh, the store the next morning, and I canceled my order, and I went on an obsessive search to find a wood stove that was actually environmentally efficient. And I came across a company in New Hampshire, I think they're in New Hampshire, called Woodstock Soapstone. And they make these funky little stoves, uh, nowhere near as pretty as the one I originally wanted to buy, uh, shown in this picture, that have the lowest emission rates of any wood stove on the market. So I bought the wood stove. Of course, none of the local contractors would install it because it wasn't one of the products they were selling. So I had to find a contractor from 40 miles away who came in and did the installation, did a beautiful job. But that was only part of the story. I realized I couldn't burn wood from some, some guy 50 miles away who was cutting, clear cutting a site, loading it up on the truck and burning gasoline to get it to my house. So I realized I had to source my own wood for my own wood lot. So, uh, this past year I hired a logger, uh, a forest, rather, he came to the site, and uh, we we went to all the down trees on the site, and picked out the hardwoods that were still in good shape. He cut them into sections for me, and over this past uh, summer, I've been dragging that wood in my real barrel back to the house, and splitting the wood, and um, I've already got about a, a a quart of wood split, and I'm about halfway through all the wood on the property, and that to me is finally what's needed to to sustain sustainably burn wood to source it on site and um, and also burn it in an ultra efficient system. Uh, and to go on to more details in the picture, you can see my little raised beds because my soil is is kind of acidic. So I had to create raised beds, and I I grow. This is my third year. I grow an incredible variety of crops just on lots of little raised beds. I I have broccoli and tomatoes and uh, uh, squash and uh, let's see, um, oh peas and beans and carrots and uh, scallions and uh, and my uh, raspberry crop just came in an amazing amount of raspberries uh, and I had blackberries on the property and uh, something is changing perhaps related to climate change or or just natural succession uh, not quite so many blackberries anymore but uh, but I am producing a lot of our own food during the summer and it's a wonderful wonderful experience and. My next, step, my next step is to actually learn how to do some canning and, uh, uh, and uh, learn to produce enough food to actually out throughout the year. Uh, the lower picture, lower left-hand picture, is my forest, which is a hemlock forest. I'm one of the, the few areas in the Catskills that still have a standing hemlock forest. But unfortunately, the, the Catskills, is, as many other uh, wooded areas around the country, are being heavily impacted by invasives. Uh, we've got... Um, uh, the pine beetle and uh, the emerald ash borer, and also affecting the hemlock, the uh, the woolly adelgid, which I think is a beetle that's attacking hemlock trees. And um, luckily, my stand is still pretty healthy. Uh, there have been a lot of efforts of bringing in natural controls, and I'm hoping that uh, they can be de deployed on my property if if need be. But I've worked really hard to reduce my footprint and to create something of a, a self-sustaining living environment in the, in my home in this region. So beautiful region, great community, and I'm trying to be a, a responsible part of the community. Also very active with the Transition Catskills group and another environmental group in the region, and I'm also involved with local economic development to help, help promote the uh, local agriculture industry in our region. So uh, before I go on to the next section, any other questions or comments? No, I don't see anything else new right now. Keep on moving. Okay. I guess I, not, not a question, but a comment. Are those 1K uh, panels, each of them? So it looks like you have 18 total. Uh, no, it's, um, I think they're free, 300 watts each. So my, my total output is 5,400 watts. 54, okay. I was yeah, able to get 34. I'll go ahead. Oh, yeah, um, the house is a small house, and I have uh, skylights and, uh, it's very efficient, so I, I, as I said, I am net positive, um, even with a relatively small array. And the next step is to come up with a battery system, so I do have some storage. Right. Yeah, very cool. 
I was able to get uh, 34 one, 1K panels at an auction recently for a ridiculously low price because they had been manufactured by a company locally here that went bankrupt and, and they, they had a great excess. And so anyway, I haven't set them up yet, but I've got a th equivalent to about 34K system, so pretty large. Uh, that, that is great. And uh, what we're finding, there's, there's a wonderful report out of MIT from a couple of years ago about the transition to solar. And what we're finding is the cost of the panels is not the major cost of putting in these systems. It's dealing with the local governments and uh, getting all the, all the necessary approvals. Um, and by the way, uh, many people were shocked in our region after Hurricane Sandy to find out that uh, their solar systems didn't work if there was a, a grid outage. We, we lost power in the Catskills for over a week. And luckily now the manufacturers of the inverters, which are what convert the solar power to AC power to either use in the house or send back out to the grid, uh, are now providing inverters that can actually produce some power even when you lose the grid. It's a concept called islanding, and you can disconnect from the grid and uh, use some power on your own. And uh, as long as the sun is shining, you can get some power directly from your grid, and if you incorporate batteries, you have get power throughout the night. Uh, so I'm looking into battery systems that are both sustainable and, uh, and can provide some resilience for me. So uh, shifting perspectives um, and my professional areas of work, I won't say professional, but my areas of focus in my life. Um, go on to the next slide. I become much more aware of, uh, of systems thinking and understanding that uh, that everything in the biosphere is connected. Uh, I have a quote here from a fellow by the name of um, Bob Costanza, who is uh, an ecological economist, which, by the way, is different from an environmental economist. Uh, and I'll explain why in a minute. But, uh, but Costanza, in a recent study, notes that the services of, ec of ecological systems and the natural capital stocks that produce them are critical to the functioning of Earth's life support system. They contribute to human welfare, both directly and indirectly, and therefore represent part of the total economic value of the planet. And this builds on what I mentioned earlier in the presentation, that, uh, that we are totally dependent on the natural world, and everything in our lives is derived either directly or indirectly from the natural world. And Costanza uh, caused a bit of controversy back in 1996, I think it was, uh, when he came up with a dollar value for all of the systems in the natural world that support human civilization. And there was a tremendous amount of controversy uh, by the people who didn't want to believe this because they felt it's all about human endeavor, who said, no, no, it's about the human economy. That's what provides value. And the, the, the deep ecologists who said, no, no, you can't put any value on nature. Nature is spiritual. Nature is, is all embracing. How dare you put a dollar value on it? But it was a very valuable exercise because it helped people who focus very much in the economic world to see that the economic output of society is dependent upon the, the output of the natural world and that we, we need to see the natural world as part of our economic system and economic well-being. And that study was very crude and besides the, the philosophical controversy, there was also a lot of technical controversy about how, how relevant it was. So he redid the study uh, using similar uh, framework in 19, I'm sorry, in 2014, and the cited paper here, and, and Wayne, if you could share this presentation with people, there are a lot of citations in here, but I, I highly recommend you read this study because he, he identified some numbers, and I can't pull them out of, out of my head right now, but basically what he found in 2012, I think, which was a reference here for the study, that the natural world was pro providing far more economic value than the value of all of our human endeavors and that we need to consider the natural world in our decision-making lest we lose the economic output of, of human endeavors. And um, that actually they found that the natural world, that the economic value of the natural world had diminished significantly between their early work in 1996, which was based, I think, on 1994 data, and 2012. So in less than 20 years, I think they identified about a 20% loss of ecosystem services when put into monetary uh, terms. So very similar to the, the data that came out of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, but that was more of a, a qualitative assessment. Costanza attempted to do a quantitative evaluation, still general, generating a lot of controversy, but making the point that 
as we're drawing down capital stocks, we're, we're going to eventually draw down our ability to produce economic output. Uh, so we need to come up with more of a systems view and understand that everything is connected to everything else, that we are, that everything in the biosphere is interconnected and interdependent, which includes us, by the way, and includes our economy. Um, and I, I wrote here, we need to bring this understanding to our local communities where such connections are immediately relevant and deeply felt. And this notably includes agriculture, where direct impacts, um, which directly impacts and is dependent upon the natural world, as I mentioned in an earlier slide. But I want to modify this slightly, because after I wrote it, I realized I, I misspoke, because it really, really should read something along the lines of, we need to engage with local communities to, to help create the shared understanding uh, that we are dependent on the natural world and focus in on those areas where it's immediately obvious. So local agriculture or, or a decision by a community to build a Walmart in a, in a, in a, um, a meadow or a forest and, and not just use the term development and assume that there's nothing there now and the Walmart will provide economic value. Uh, we need to look at the value of that of that um, that meadow or that farmland or that uh, uh, or that forest before we make a decision about the Walmart. Yes, the Walmart might bring us uh, goods and services that we need in our community. If the community is isolated from a major city, if we don't have other economic ac opportunities, uh, that's a whole sub a separate subject. But I won't get into that right now about the impact on local economies. But just from the environmental perspective, ask the question. What are we giving up when we take that forest or field or farm and make it into a Walmart and a parking lot? Uh, asking questions like, well, if we, uh, if we take this land and, and pave it over, how will that change uh, hydro hydrologic flows? Will it overwhelm a river which could undermine a road adjacent to the river or undermine a bridge that goes over the river? And what will be the cost of that? And communities are beginning to ask these questions, and these are these are relevant issues at the local level, and we need to get this holistic thinking into local discourse because it's the only way we're going to be able to make reasonable evaluations about whether it is indeed appropriate from the point of view of the community to allow the building of that Walmart. Um, these are complex issues, and unfortunately, the voice in nature hasn't been brought up in very many community planning meetings, and there needs to be... Um, advocacy for nature because of its own intrinsic value, but advocacy for nature because of the ecosystem services that it provides for that local community. So this is the shift that I'm going through is that, yes, the big global issues are critically important, but certainly in this administration in the United States, EPA basically the lights are out at the Environmental Protection Agency. Well, worse than that, the lights are on uh, to bend over backwards to accommodate industry and uh, and I've worked with industry all my all my professional life and I do not see industry as consummate evil but the voices of industry that are that are being heard in the halls of government in Washington right now are not the voices of balance and reason they're the voice voices of exploitation uh, so unfortunately we don't have a mechanism that's very powerful at the national level and even in many of our states so my shift locally is, is a matter of practical reality, but also an understanding that if we don't do it at the local level, if we don't engage and speak to issues that are immediately at hand, uh, we're never going to build consensus or at least broad-based support for environmental advocacy or even social justice issues. Uh, next slide. Uh, this slide is just uh, putting in pictures all the words I've just said. Um, I'll wait till it comes up on the screen. Yeah. Uh, the soil is related to the water in the mountains. Uh, the seeds and the variety of seeds are related to the health of the soil and the health of the ecosystem. And the, the availability of all these, this beautiful array of seeds creates a beautiful array of food that provides nutritional value for people. It's all connected. It's painfully obvious if we just open our eyes and open our hearts. And the little chart at the bottom, I hope you can see this, this chart comes from Costanza's 2014 study, and it, it simply illustrates that human well-being is a function of the natural world and that our built capital, our buildings, our factories, the human capital, our ingenuity, our knowledge, our social capital, our relationships, and not shown here, but the financial capital that derives from human endeavor are all subsets of the natural world. And human well-being 
comes from the interplay of all these forms of capital, all embedded within natural capital, all part of the biosphere. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. The United Nations recently produced the Sustainable Development Goals, and this next slide shows the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that uh, that are characterize that are presented in a way to characterize uh, healthy human well-being, uh, wholesome human well-being on this planet. That we need to alleviate poverty. We need to be able to feed people. Uh, we need to have good health and, and physical well-being, uh, quality education, gender equity. You can read through all these yourself. And if you go to the UN website, there's tremendous detail on all of these elements of human well-being. Uh, what this doesn't really make clear, and many theorists have been refining the development goals to make the point that the ones that are most critical here are the ones that provide a wholesome biosphere. So climate action and clean drinking water, uh, these and, uh, and healthy land systems and healthy ocean systems, if these elements of the sustainable development goals, so these goals, achieving optimi optimizing these goals are not attended to, we will never have gender equity, we will never have uh, social justice, uh, we will never have opportunities for education. But my students this year and my wife have made it very clear to me that we need to also shift the perspective a little bit from what I've just presented, and that is that unless we help to help people who are disenfranchised to be empowered, unless we work to facilitate gender equity and access to education, we are never going to bring enough people into this discussion so that we can move toward a broad-based support and, and something of a consensus that we actually need to address, address climate change. We actually need to protect oceans and and, and freshwater resources and natural landscapes. Uh, so it's a very complex system. It is a systemic approach that we need to embrace to understand that unless we work hard to protect the natural world, to engage people, to educate people, to allow people to represent their perspectives and their views, we're not going to get to a sustainable world. And these goals are lofty goals. The UN has developed hundreds of objectives within these goals. And actually, the private sector, many of my colleagues in the private sector, are looking at these goals and saying, well, what can we do? How can we play a role in advancing these goals? Uh, one of my good friends was in charge of sustainable development for the dairy industry. And, and her industry asked her to look at these goals and see what, beyond just the obvious addressing hunger, what can their industry do to begin to attend to these goals and, and make a reasonable contribution toward to achieving these goals over time. So we are, we are starting to make some, some reasonable progress. Uh, go on to the next slide. This next slide sums it all up in the most beautiful, simple way, and I just want to dwell on this one for a moment. This is a quote from a permaculturalist by the name of Byron Joel. Uh, Joel is a permaculturalist in uh, southwest Australia, and he says, ecology is the primary economy ecological function is true wealth. So it's not how much money you have in the bank, how many buildings you own, but is the biosphere that sustains your life and all life on this planet, is it functioning? Is it wholesome and healthy? Because if it's not, everything else is meaningless. And um, this is taken from an essay that Byron Joel wrote recently about his experience in uh, Morocco. Um, and the essay it can be um, found on his website, and it's called The Lesson in Identity. And Byron, who is a man in his early 30s, was asked to come to Morocco to go to a rural community to help them improve their agricultural systems because the community was starting to feel the effects of climate change. Uh, they were also in, in a region where the hydrology had been changed because of a massive dam project, and as a result, their agricultural yield had diminished, and they were struggling. So they brought him in as a permaculture expert. And he had a bit of an anxiety attack in preparing for this, uh, this training where he realized how could he, this white guy from a post-industrial society, 30 some odd years old, have the right to go to an indigenous community and educate them on what's the right thing to do to improve their agriculture. And he really struggled with this. He didn't want to be this outsider coming in with systems and ideas that may not be relevant or at least would not attuned or, or sensitive to their conditions. 
And he, he, he struggled to the point that he realized he's not going to go in and give them his packaged uh, presentation. He is going to go in there and shut his mouth and listen and travel around and talk to people in the community before convening his, uh, his sessions. And as a result, he didn't give a packaged presentation. He brought the people in from the community and just started with a design project. Asked them what the challenges were, asked them what their traditional agricultural systems were, why those systems weren't working, and they basically did what's called a permaculture design project or a design, uh, oh, I forgot the term they use for it in permaculture, uh, uh, for want of a better, the proper term, a permaculture design course. You know, was rather than actually doing an educational program, they looked at their farms and their their region and did a design project where as they were going through the project he would seed in permaculture principles so that they understood what had been learned through permaculture which actually was a, a concept that was developed uh, in Australia and now is a national well, it's a movement, it's, it's actually a science now called agroecology um, as well as a suite of practices and he had a wonderfully positive experience for himself as well as creating an opportunity for the people in this community to begin to adapt to the, the global changes and the local changes that they were, they were experiencing. So this has become one of my favorite quotes because it, it is the essence of, of all we're talking about here, is that we need to understand that ecology is the primary economy and ecological function is, what true, is the definition of true wealth. Uh, so going to the next slide, um, I'm getting to the end. I just want to quickly go through the last couple of slides. Uh, another seminal influence, <laughs> recent, <laughs> recent seminal influence, if I could put it that way, is a book that I read a few months ago called um, Prosperity Without Growth, and it was written by a fellow named Tim Jackson. Tim Jackson is an economist, and in 2008, he was charged, uh, well, actually a few years before that, was charged to uh, head up a sustainable development commission in the United Kingdom. And he had produced a report, he and his colleagues produced a report, uh, by the same title in 2008, uh, exploring principles of regenerative economy and sustainability and permaculture to help the UK head off on a path that would be more sustainable, more regenerative. Um, and this report was basically about exploring the notion of no growth, that we need to slow down, we need to stop this consumerism, this mass consumption economy that we have and rethink how we become more aligned with natural systems. Unfortunately, you may, the year 2008 may have some relevance for you because that, because that was the year of the global economic crash. And coincidentally, just around the time when the crash occurred, the G8, now the G7 group of nations were to meet in, in London, and the United Kingdom is hosting, as they do, revolve, uh, it's a rolling uh, hosting of, of the, this group of nations. And, the United Kingdom was scheduled to host this next meeting. So, of course, the meeting was going to focus on how do we gin up the economy? How do we do what's called quantitative easing? How do we pump money into the economy because we've got to keep this, this machine going? So, to, suffice it to say, the UK government wanted no part of prosperity without growth. And the report was, was shelved. Uh, the government was not going to release it, especially as the leaders of these nations were coming to London to figure out how to keep the economy growing. So the report died uh, on the vine. But this was also the time when the internet was really getting going and the report went viral. It was uh, translated into many different languages and gained a tremendous amount of, of traction even though it was never endorsed by the UK government which had originally commissioned the study. So uh, seven years go by, and I'm sorry, 2016, eight years go by and um, Meanwhile, uh, Tim Jackson leaves, leaves the UK government and works with many colleagues around the country, including colleagues at the Post Carbon Institute, and uh, I think they're based here in the US and in Canada, uh, to refine these ideas. And I highly recommend this book. I assigned it to my class this past semester, and as you can see bulleted here, it talks about limiting growth and limiting consumerism, uh, tackling inequity, fixing the economics to, to create an economic system that understands natural capital. Uh, this report is, is in the second edition. Uh, it's not a, a UK government report now. It's, it's a privately produced report. Uh, if you buy this book, make sure you get the second edition because it is a, a remarkable revision over the original work that was done in 2008. And um, 
bear with me, I lost my train of thought here for a moment. Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, so I assigned this to my class, and it's, it, it's beautifully written, very far-reaching, and I assigned it to my graduate class on corporate sustainability. And I thought the students would just love this, and it would be inspiring, because these are young people, people in it mid to late 20s, early 30s, people just going out in the world who are probably more inspired than I am, more focused on, on idealism than I am. Well, I got some substantial pushback. Many of my students were, were rather angry at me that I assigned this book. And they said, okay, this is all really nice, and Tim Jackson is a visionary, but we need to go into the corporate world and get jobs, and we need to work within the existing system, which is essentially, even at its best, an incrementalist approach to sustainable development. And they felt that this was not useful for them. This was too pie in the sky, too, uh, too much of a dreamer uh, approach to be relevant for their careers. And um, it was really shocking to me to realize that, uh, that these people didn't find practical application in this because they wanted stuff they could take into a job interview and, and spouting some of these ideas in a job interview with, uh, with GE or uh, Unilever, well maybe Unilever would be different, but some of the big corporations uh, was not going to work. They needed to talk about how they could do uh, uh, carbon, uh, carbon reduction modeling and greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission reductions, and, uh, putting up more solar panels on factories, and this was just too far out there for them. But uh, if you're not looking for a job and don't need good stuff for a job interview, take a look at this book because it is, it is truly inspirational. And not just inspirational from a conceptual point of view, but inspirational based on some really hard, hard wrought economic principles. Uh, so um, that, that speaks to how my perspective has shifted and how I'm very much focused on whole systems, focused on communities. and. I understand that we've got to make global changes because the issues are global, but we may need to face the reality that our global systems are not going to change, that governments are not going to get on this bandwagon. And I don't just mean the Trump administration, administration and its corporate patients who have absolute hostility towards sustainability and environmental action. Even many countries that signed the Paris Climate Accord uh, are thinking in rather incrementalist terms, and even though all the nations that signed on to the accord, something in the order of 200 nations, have all committed to doing national plans to, reduc to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It is a rather incrementalist approach, and we may not get there. As a global society, we may see significant downturn economically in terms of human well-being. But I think there will, even if that happens, and I hope it doesn't, there will be places where people understand the big picture and get it right. They may be individual states, they may be a few individual nations. Maybe the UK, if they survive Brexit, may be one of those nations. Certainly some of the Scandinavian countries are very much ahead of the curve. Uh, but it might just be communities, it might be municipalities, it might be neighborhoods, but there are going to be places where people understand this dynamic and create a community milieu, or create a community connection that actually builds and restores natural systems and the place of humans within those systems. So. That has been very much the shift of my focus. I'm still involved in national and international issues. I still teach corporate sustainability at a leading university. I still interact with corporations. In fact, I do get a couple of corporate cl consulting clients periodically and uh, haven't scared them off. Uh, but my heart and my emotion and a lot of my work is at the local level. So uh, a couple of quick slides if you go on to the next one. Uh, at the local level, much of my focus is on food systems. And uh, I'll wait till the picture comes up. There. Uh, this is uh, some of the produce from my farm last year, and that's a bee on my property. Um, not my bee, <laughs> a bee who happens to have uh, come to my house and is, uh, is doing his pollination thing there. Um, but these are my tomato plants and my beets and my tomato, uh, mature tomato and blackberries and all sorts of other goodies. And I... I am very proud of that, and it just grounds me in where I live. Uh, next slide. Uh, but much of my focus is on the transition to regenerative or sustainable agriculture. And it is very simple. You may hear many different terms, uh, definitions of the term, rather, and many different types of, of, uh, of sustainable agriculture. But essentially, sustainable or regenerative agriculture is agriculture that feeds people, nourishes people, not just junk food, 
restores and protects the land, air, water, and other species on our planet. And I know here in parentheses across the full product life cycle because it's not just uh, agriculture is not just the farm. It's the it's the processing. It's the transport. It's the uh, the value added products. We need to make the whole system regenerative, and um, it also works to to be it to be resilient and to mitigate climate change, and provide livelihoods and dignity for farmers, their workers, and rural communities. If we get all this right, we will have agricultural systems that are regenerative. Next slide. This next slide is kind of my manifesto, and uh, I teach sustainable agriculture. I've taught sustainable ag for about three or four years, and I, I've reduced it down to this, to this political agenda, if you would. Uh, we need to consider what we eat, uh, the things we conceive, consume, not just nutrients, but our snacks, our libations, um, our sweeteners, because many of these things, which don't bring the nutritional value, actually represent huge percentages of, of agricultural production and agricultural impact. We also have to uh, look at what's grown on the land, not just food, but also animal feed, textiles, corn-based ethanol, uh, because, again, these things represent large portions of our agricultural production. And work with our local and state governments to try to have some role in, what, <clears throat> in agricultural planning, because we're seeing a dramatic transition in many areas away from family agriculture to corporate acquisition, and this is not always good. And uh, it's, not, it's not always because the family farm is inefficient or poorly run. It's often because of factors beyond the control of the farmer uh, in terms of getting access to markets, uh, having access to raw materials, seed, and agricultural amendments. And, and state and local governments need to play an important role in helping farmers to be able to stay in business. Good farmers that know economic and understand economics and understand farming, but are being driven out by forces beyond their control, and that includes trying to control acquisition by uh, by corporations. In New York State, uh, where I took my permaculture design course uh, in the Finger Lakes region of New York, which is a little further upstate than where I am, uh, there is a major land grab going on by corporate farmers, and the 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 it's not a corporation who set up a, a big uh, corporate headquarters in town that's doing the acquisition. It's a local dairyman who claims to be acquiring the land for his own use, but uh, anybody who knows the backstory knows that he's actually representing a, a European investment consortium that's buying up land because they understand that our region is going to be more productive over time due to climate change. They are looking at the climate models. They're not climate activists, but they understand that uh, the climate change is real and they want access to that farmland. So uh, governments need to get involved in protecting this resource. Uh, next slide. But, but this corporate involvement, by the way, in local ag is not all bad. There's actually a, uh, a lot of invest, uh, what are called impact investors and even more conventional investment groups that are seeing value in acquiring farmland and either converting to organic or helping to continue to keep that land in organic production or sustainable, sustainable production. Uh, and they're very cognizant of the fact that farmers need equity and are actually coming up with very innovative approaches to lease land to farmers, but to provide opportunities for farmers to purchase that land over time, often at, at below market rates. I think Wayne is involved in some of this work. And so when, when we work with our local governments to, to look at and have an impact on corporate involvement, we need to understand that corporate involvement is not all bad, that there are actually a lot of corporate investment and investment groups that are coming into local regions to bring to infuse resources, financial resources into those communities uh, to help improve local agriculture. And finally, my last bullet here is to we need to realize, and this is a message I've already mentioned, that it's not just trying to restore local ag, it's also uh, working with and putting pressure on the agribusiness industry to help them play a more sustainable role in their production systems. And I've worked with agribiz companies, and I've seen some significant improvements in their practices as well. And I, we're running out of time, so I won't go into detail, but really encouraging news, even from the corporate sector. And also, as I do, where possible, grow and preserve your own food. Um, and um, as we did during World War II, build those victory gardens. Uh, but understand that there are, there's a very complex dimension. This is a complex story, and we need to be sensitive to all all the complexity as we begin to move toward more regenerative food systems. And I know, Mark, you posted a little video clip uh, in the announcement for this that 
uh, focuses on some of the ag innovations. And uh, much of that seems kind of high tech and corporate. Uh, and much of my presentation has been around local farms and, and lo uh, local farming communities. Uh, but I, I see value in, in improving the technology and the, uh, the innovation in agriculture as well. And I don't see them as mutually exclusive. We need to, uh, and by the way, there's an article that I wrote that may have been posted already, but it's included in this presentation that talks about how we need to bring people together. We need to create collaboration to move towards sustainable ag systems because the, the small farmer who's working on five acres of land may have something to teach the corporation. And, uh, and if there's a partnership between that small farmer and corporate interests and land-grant universities, maybe his or her innovation can be spread nationally through these broader mechanisms. And um, so there's value in collaboration, and there's value at all levels and all dimensions of agriculture, and we need to somehow learn to work together. Uh, one of the last slides, I keep saying last, uh, two more slides, but they're simple ones. Go on to the next one, Wayne. This next one is a quote from a, an organic farmer uh, who was speaking on a U.S. Department of Agriculture webinar a couple of years ago, and he said, showing a profit means touching something and leaving it better than you found it. His name is Jim Rohn. I think he's in uh, Ohio, if I'm not mistaken. Wayne, you may know him. He's a pretty well-known guy. Uh, but this, this quote is so powerful because think about this. You're going onto a piece of land. You're producing a crop, and you're taking that crop off the land and bringing it to market, hopefully making a good return on investment. But not only are you bringing a product off that land, but every time you do something on that land, every time you act to produce that crop, you are enhancing that resource. You are making that farm better by producing something. How many factories get better by producing widgets? You produce 100,000 widgets in your factory. You're wearing out equipment. You're using resources. Um, th that's a very different model. This is a, a circular model, a, a, a systems model that is sustainable agriculture, where as you're producing a product, you are making the asset better. What a wonderful construct. Isn't that what nature is? Isn't that what ecosystems are? Isn't that what the biosphere is? Um, this is a, pra a construct that we are now bringing not just to agriculture, but to all business systems. And if we don't get this right, we're in big trouble. But if we do get this right in all human dimensions, um, we will be in a much better place in terms of human well-being. And go on to the next slide. Uh, we're not in this game alone. There are, there are others out there. And uh, this guy is asking a question, metaphorically. Uh, after man, will the world be safe for gorilla? Uh, and this quote comes from a wonderful book, which I highly recommend, uh, called Ishmael by, Dan, by Daniel Quinn. And uh, this is making the point, it's sort of a deep ecology notion that other creatures have an intrinsic value to live out their lives. And it's not just about us. Uh, we are part of this. We are no better than this guy and no better than an earthworm. We are all in it together. And when we think in terms of regenerative systems, we don't just make life better for people. We make life better for gorilla. Now, this, this novel is about a silverback gorilla who was captured in Africa and brought to the United States as a, uh, as a pet. I'm sorry, uh, for a zoo. Uh, the zoo closed, and a wealthy man bought the gorilla as a pet and set up a cage for the gorilla on his property, and over time came to realize that this gorilla was extremely uh, intelligent, and the relationship shifted from pet master to father son, and the gorilla learned to read and speak. This is a novel, by the way. And uh, when the man died, he bequeathed that the gorilla be given the resources to interact with the human world because the gorilla was in a unique position to offer the only non-human commentary on human civilization. And the book was filled with incredible insights uh, about human civilization that could only be offered from a non-human perspective. And uh, it is just a beautiful approach to systems thinking and understanding that we are, we are interrelated and intimately dependent on other creatures and the natural world. And they are dependent on us, and they are asking us to get it right. Uh, so the last slide is just a, a list of recommended readings. And um, many of these readings are readings that I've been recommending for years, and I'm deeply inspired by, and I, I urge you to take a look at these. And if we have a few minutes, I can mention a few others. So I went on probably a bit longer, Wayne, but um, 
But this is my life in a nutshell. Jeffrey, thank you so much. You, you, don't worry about the time. Um, matter of fact, if we put this out as a replay, Mark and I will talk about it, but we'll probably put it into two sections. And so we'll cut the time in half and we'll, we'll find a good stopping spot. And we, we kept all of our audience here for most of this time, so that's pretty cool. Um, anyway, uh, Mark, I'm sure, has put this entire presentation up in the chat. And it will obviously also be as a download on the, on the, on the uh, website so you guys can get all of these references. Jeffrey, that was awesome. Um, I want to reach out to you even in the next week and just talk about a bigger picture circumstance um, and um, just just compare notes on different things. But but since we are, we have run fairly late. Actually, I think there's even another page of these references. I'm seeing this. By the way, it looks like I've got one more. Oh, that's just my contact information. Ah, uh, that's your contact. Well, that's useful too. <laughs> so that yes. Uh, yes. Please feel free to contact uh, me if you have any questions. You know, I, I don't know Jeffrey more than our conversation, but I can tell from his talk everything. The guy is is very sincere. This is not just something he teaches. He's living it, and um, I know all of you are too, and, and to the best of your ability. So, anyway, Mark, why don't you? Uh, well, one. Oh, I'm sorry, Wayne. Wayne, excuse me. I, I forgot to mention something very important. Uh, Matt, yes, go, ahead. go ahead. Now, um, in yes, the book Ishmael, uh, one of the most poignant points in that book is uh, Ishmael asks uh, his students because he has a number of students, which is a wonderful tale about how an instructor. I'm sorry, how, how a gorilla could have students, but uh, read the book and you'll find out about that. But he, in the book, he says, um, you look around and you think this is civilization. This is not civilization. This is a civilization. And just because it's been around for 10,000 years doesn't mean that it is the culmination of all human endeavor. Humans have been on this planet for, now we've learned, 300,000 years. Our agriculture-based civilization has only been around for about 10,000. There were a lot of experiments and innovations that either might have gotten lost or are still around among indigenous peoples. And we need to be open to the fact that this is not the best. This is not the culmination. There's still room for refinement, still room for rethinking, and still room for learning uh, from indigenous peoples, uh, from people of various walks of life within our own civilization, and from animals. Uh, there have been researchers that, said, that have explored the elephant communities in Africa and have actually put forward the radical notion that there may be elements of, of elephant society that may be more advanced than human society. So there's a lot of learning to be had if we can step away from the notion that this is not the culmination of, of all human endeavor and that we do have room for change and rethinking. What a great, uh, what a great, great way to end this. Several people have said thank you so much. Appreciate everything. Thank you, Monique, for, for that. And others. Uh, again, we'll put this up on the on the site. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. I apologize we started earlier, but we got we got finished a little bit earlier this way. So um, 